Now, you might notice that compared to our weekly plan, we're a little bit out of sync and I've decided to change the, the structure of this week and next week's lectures. Um, so this week we're doing chapters seven and eight, which is materiality and risk and internal controls, and they actually sort of go together. Um, so I sort of had my plan for the semester one way and then I changed my mind when I uh, was thinking about what we've done so far. So I'm going to start with the same sort of concept map that we always do. All right? Are you finding the concept maps helpful? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. If you, if you think it's not helpful, let me know and I'll stop doing them. But let's start with what we know we have at the end. All right, our audit report. We know that that is the last component that we produce. All right, now to create my audit report, what do I need? I need audit evidence. All right, I need to be able to generate evidence to create my report. I know that that audit evidence needs to take into account the assertions and I know that I have different sorts of assertions that feed into my audit evidence. And I know that I have my procedures or my tests. And remember, I've got nine of these. All right. OK, procedures, tests, audit report. What we learned last week is that we need to think about who do we select as clients? Something terribly exciting is happening outside. All right. And our clients, we eventually sign a contract with called an engagement letter. All right. So that's up there. We also learned uh, the other week that one of the key things we need to do when we're selecting clients is understand the client under ASA, what number? 315. All right, okay, so let's join some of these things together. I'm going to get a little pen here. All right, so my audit report requires my audit evidence, and I have to give an audit report because of my engagement letter. My audit evidence is organized based on assertions and then my procedures, and I know that my procedures and my assertions are also linked together. Right. Some procedures go better with some assertions. We know that about vouching and occurrence or existence. And we know that about tracing and completeness. And we know that recalculation is a really great procedure to use for accuracy and valuation. Now, how do I figure out, for my audit evidence, uh, we know that who we select, we need to understand our client. Obviously, that links to the engagement letter. And understanding the client will help us identify risks of misstatement. Okay, and when we think about risks of misstatement, we think about a couple of different things. We need to think about materiality, which is which misstatements um, am I looking for? And we're going to explore that a little bit today. And then we also need to think about the source of our risk. All right. And if you've been to a toot today, we know that the company has business risks that management needs to be aware of. We also know that we have inherent risks. And that's probably one of the hardest things to try and get a hold of. And today, we're going to learn about something called control risks. All right. So control risks and materiality are uh, concepts we're going to get into today. So let me, understanding the client will help us identify where there are more likely risks. The risks will help us figure out what audit evidence we need to collect, which assertions are more at risk of misstatement, which procedures. And our risk comes from a couple of different areas. There are business risks that could be inherent. There are inherent risks on their own. And then there are also control risks, okay? And materiality, we'll, we'll learn about today, we'll figure into how we collect our audit evidence, all right? So today's focus is going to be on a couple of different areas. 
And those areas are going to be materiality. What does it mean for something to be material? We're going to look at control risks and inherent risks in a bit more detail. All right. And then that's going to catapult us into next week where we start looking at how do we actually go about collecting this evidence, designing and actual doing. All right. So, and you might have noticed, look, they, there are 70 slides this week, but about 20 of them are just little chapter or objective titles. So it's not as many, uh, it's not as scary as we think it might be. So today, what are we going to uh, look at in terms of our objectives? We're going to look at what is this idea of materiality? Uh, and we're going to look at different types of judgments in relation to materiality. We make materiality at the planning stage and then at the actual um, finalisation of the audit stage. We're going to look at something called the audit risk model. And if you don't quite get the audit risk model after our lecture today, then you're, that's absolutely okay. Because about 95% of students struggle with audit risk model. All right. And as a result, there are about three or four different videos that go through that in a lot more detail. So I'm going to give you sort of the five-minute overview uh, and brief explanation. If you get it, that's fantastic. If you don't, then there are some self-paced videos for you to watch that will really give you a great um, understanding of audit risk model. Uh, so we're going to look at the audit risk model because the audit risk model is actually used to help us plan the rest of the audit. So it helps us plan and execute our audit strategy. And we're going to talk about those options in terms of strategy. Uh, we're going back to inherent risk, which we've already looked at a little bit today. We're going to look at uh, how risk and evidence are related and how materiality risk and evidence are related as well. So what is the idea of materiality? And I've actually gone back to ASA 320. And uh, all of our ASA in the 300s are all about that planning stage. And it says there, it's something that is applied to the auditor in planning and performing the audit and in evaluating the effect of identified misstatements um, and how they impact on the financial report. So in planning the audit, the auditor makes judgments about the misstatements that are considered material. What does material mean? Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit of a, uh, I think, on one of the next slides. But thinking about the misstatements will affect what sort of audit procedures we're going to do. We're gonna, it's going to affect how we identify risk. And then if we find something, what we do next. Okay? So just like when you're studying as a student, if I tell you that one topic is worth 50% of the final exam, you're going to say, oh, that topic is really important to study that topic for you guys is going to become material. If you didn't know it, then not knowing it could have a severe impact on the outcome of your studies. All right. So materiality is this idea sometimes of, oh, can't change pen colours, severity or impact. All right. And we're going to learn that materiality will take on one of two components. It can be quantitative related to dollars or it could be qualitative. All right. And this was the target case where they said, look, the $23 million that they had um, overstated profits by is immaterial in the entire context of West Farmers. All right. now, it ha would have a less than $1 million impact on the entire company. But qualitatively, they thought it was important, management thought it was important because it reflected how those executives did business. And of course, if we find out that management have manipulated one part of the accounts, we're worried that they're going to manipulate something else. Right? It's sort of like, you know, your parents trust you to do certain things. And when you turn 18, they might be a bit reluctant to let you go out at night, but they say, okay, well, you know, we're lending you the car because we trust you. And uh, you have an accident and you come back or your parents have to pick you up and you say, oh, look, it, it wasn't me. You know, this truck just jumped out from behind a pole and hit me. 
And then later they look at, you know, some speed camera footage or a red light camera footage where you're clearly doing the wrong thing. And as soon as they find out you're lying, they go, well, look, we can't trust you anymore. All right? Obviously, you have to work off the cost of repairing their car, but it becomes a matter of trust and management integrity. So we're going to look at the qualitative and quantitative acts. So what does materiality mean in the context of an audit? And I've got a, a really big paragraph here. Now, you'll notice that this paragraph says A2. All right. A comes from the explanatory materials. So this is not legally enforceable, but this is explanatory material to help the auditor in their particular task. So it says there, identifying and assessing the risk of material misstatement involves the use of professional judgment. So this means not always one right answer. There's not going to be a formula that always gives you the definitive dollar amount that every single auditor should decide for a particular audit. So it allows us to identify classes of transactions, balances and disclosures, including qualitative disclosures, the misstatement of which could be material if they could reasonably expected to influence the economic decision making. Let me highlight that bit. So it's material if they could be reasonably expected to influence the economic decisions of users. Who are the users of the financial statements? Shareholders, all right. So our users there, let me do this in a different colour. Our users are going to be our shareholders. And what sort of decisions do they make? What would be an economic decision of a shareholder? Invest, all right. So the decisions are going to be, do they, what sort of decisions are they going to make about their investment? They could decide to buy more hold what they've got or sell. Okay, so that's our idea of materiality. What could influence the economic decision of those shareholders that would affect um, an, a terminology that used to be uh, within the standards but is not anymore? They used to say something along the lines of it would influence the allocation of scarce resources. Right, and as an investor, the scarce resource is your cash. So what piece of information would be so important that it would cause you to change your decision? Now, what sort of shareholders exist in a company? Uh, is every shareholder the same sort of person? So shareholders could be, they vary on size, all right? They vary in skill or knowledge, all right? And they vary in terms of their goals. Why are they holding this stock? Is it for short-term arbitrage? Is it for dividends? So, so a lot of people will invest in blue chip stocks for longer term yield. Is it for, you know, you're not so worried about dividends, but you're worried about long-term growth. You're investing for five or 10 years within that organization. In terms of size, we have our mum and dad shareholders, we have day traders, we have fund managers, and those fund managers have, again, different profiles and goals in relation to risk. Some fund managers who might be managing a very conservative or balanced fund are after long-term goals. So if you're looking about superannuation, that's generally quite often the way they work. If you're looking at a very high-risk fund manager, then their goals are gonna be different again. So it's the auditor's job to try and understand all of these shareholders and think about what is going to be important to them. Do you think that's an easy or a hard decision? A really hard one because we've got all of these different people to think about. And that makes, and I highlighted the, the word professional judgment back here, that makes auditing a really tough business to be in because there's often no right answer. And you're balancing, do I get management to adjust something or not adjust something? An adjustment um, or a misstatement might affect debt covenants. It might affect uh, abilities to raise other capital. It could affect share price. So there's a whole range of ramifications that come from identifying errors within the financial. So this is not from your textbook. I've just uh, added this diagram in here. 
but ways in which we use the term materiality. So within the standards and within the textbooks, we have the idea of planning materiality. At the very beginning of the audit, when I'm looking at which accounts have changed the most, a percentage analysis, and I'm doing my inherent risk, I sort of set a planning materiality of, overall, this is what I think. I'm interested in errors over 25,000, or 5 million, or 25 million. Then I go out and I plan my audit, and I get to the point where I need to actually collect evidence. All right? And I have what we call performance materiality. And performance materiality can be the materiality that we think we're going to have for the entire set of financial statements. And then I also have, sort of broken down as part of that, sublevels. So I might say that materiality for the whole profit and loss is 250000 But for sales, which I know is a higher risk account, I might set a specific level of materiality that's not 250,000, I might say, look, materiality for sales is 100,000 because it's high risk. So as an auditor, I don't just set one level of materiality. I end up with multiple levels of materiality within the accounts. So when I'm determining my planning materiality, I have to figure out, well, what are the risks? What is the, the inherent risk of this client? Uh, what should we be worried about? We allocate materiality to different segments or parts of the accounts. We estimate how many mi misstatements are in sales or accounts receivable. Then we estimate the combined misstatement for a balance sheet or for an income statement. And then we look at an overall assessment. All right. Now this, of course, is dollar materiality. Uh, the steps we use for examining qualitative factors is a little bit different, and we'll get to those. So how do I know what is material? Early on in the audit, I have to make some decisions um, about preliminary materiality, and then I might adjust that. All right. Now, the key thing here where the auditor might change is that the auditor needs to have flexibility. All right. We need to have flexibility because we might discover new evidence as we're auditing. So we're always finding out new things and therefore we always need to tweak um, and adjust our plan. This is sort of like a GPS. Right? You have GPS in your car and if you've got one that's connected um, to satellites that give you traffic updates, the plan might originally be to go along Route A, but suddenly you hit traffic. And it says, oh, to avoid the traffic, take this detour. All right. Then you come across a road that might be flooded. And so, oh, okay, take this other detour. So you adjust your plan as you come across different obstacles. And that's the same thing in the audit. We adjust our plan as we come across new information. All right. Especially within our subject this semester, and thank you to everybody who filled out the 13% of people that filled out the early student feedback surveys, we're doing something totally new in auditing this term. All right, we're trying the peer instruction with learning catalytics and working with groups in class, which means that every week, as you guys give us feedback about, oh my God, that question was so tough, or I found that the responses, I couldn't differentiate between them, or, oh look, you know, D was the answer to the first question, but students have really good arguments for B or C as well that we adjust our teaching strategy, we adjust the questions to reflect what feedback students are giving us. All right? So flexibility on the audit is key. If you start out with one plan and you say, I'm going to stick to that plan no matter what, the big risk is the risk of not detecting a material misstatement. Whoops, and I can't spell D. Let me try that again detecting a material misstatement, all right? Now, of course, if you don't detect a material misstatement, what could happen? Give the wrong audit opinion. If you give the wrong audit opinion, what's going to happen? You're going to get sued. So we definitely don't want that. We want that flexibility. So materiality is a relative concept rather than absolute. So materiality is not 25 million for all companies. It's not 5,000 for all companies. A lot depends on the company size. So my dad had always run small to medium-sized businesses. And for him at the end of the day, he's not worried about 
5 or 10 or $50 missing from the cash register, but he is worried when that money gets into the 200s or more. Okay? But if you're at Microsoft, $200 in the grand scheme of things is not very much. All right. Or Apple. So Apple have had their uh, first ever decline in sales, driven by the decline in iPhone sales, partly because of competition from Android phones, but partly because we're also reaching mobile phone saturation. So how many people's parents here have some sort of smartphone? Almost everybody's, right? And I went to graduations last week, and five years ago, parents were still mostly using point-and-click cameras. Now at graduations, parents are still, you know, obviously there's the, the dad or the uncle that's the camera enthusiast with the really big camera that, you know, knows what to do. But most parents are now using some sort of smartphone to take those photos. So we're reaching a point of saturation. So for a company like Apple, Hundreds of dollars is not a big deal. Tens of millions of dollars is a big deal. Right? I once found a $2 million error at a client. I'm like, oh, $2 billion. You know, I was really excited because I was 19 and auditing. And um, they said, oh, I, I went to my senior. Look, I found this $2 million mistake. And they've gone, not material. And I'm like, but it's $2 million. And they said, yeah, but not material in the overall scheme of things of a multi-billion dollar company. And they said, look, here is the materiality that we've planned out for this account, and we're really only looking for errors bigger than 12 million. All right. And obviously, as a 19-year-old, you sort of, I can't even imagine how much money $12 million looks like. But we weren't interested in things bigger than, smaller than that. So we need to figure out how we evaluate materiality, because it's usually some sort of percentage of something. All right. So is it going to be profit? Could it be based on assets? Um, profit and assets are usually the most common ones, but we need to think about what drives the client. All right. So if their own internal measures are based on profit and their KPIs, then we use some proportion of profit. If for them they make losses, then we might use something like assets or revenue. Okay. But for profit, Quite often the percentage is quite tiny, like we might be looking at something like 1% of profit. But if we're looking at total assets, it might be something like 0.05%. Can anyone tell me why I would have such big differences? Any ideas? Why would I use only 1% of profit but half a percent of assets? somebody. Any ideas? Somebody said something up the back. No? Size of those accounts. All right? And you probably end up with a similar number here, but assets is so much bigger, we take a much smaller percentage. All right? So no matter what the base, you pick the same one, and then you think about what qualitative factors could affect. Is this account highly susceptible to fraud? Fraud is always qualitatively material, even if it's not a big dollar amount, which is the, the target uh, case. All right, so I'll write target there. And in case you forget what I'm talking about, I will draw the little symbol there for the store mm -hmm. so that you know that's, that's it's not an I there. Sorry, buddy. Now, we also have to contend with AASB 1031, and if you thought, oh, I'm in auditing, I'll never have to look at accounting standards again, they're back. And AASB 1031 has their own guidelines, which say that anything greater than 10% is presumed to be material, right? Greater than 10% presumed to be material, less than 5% not material, and in between is a matter of the auditor's professional judgment. All right. So five, the 5 and 10% rule, though sometimes some things that are less than 5% like related party transactions. <coughs> Oops, change pen colours. All right. For something like related parties, uh, too thick. 
Related parties are always going to be qualitatively material because there are transactions at arm's length that may unfairly advantage somebody within the firm or a party that they know. So even though related party transactions might be 1% of transactions or 0.5% of a percent of transactions, it is qualitatively important. Be the same as if you had a small environmental disaster in which the cleanup cost wasn't significant and it wasn't material, but the fact that you had a natural disaster and there could be flow on effects is qualitatively important. So, objective number three, we're going to look at audited segments. And this comes back to, again, remember my diagram from up here where we have individual accounts of materiality. Um, and so most people allocate materiality uh, to balance sheet accounts, but this, let me make sure I'm using the right pen here. Yep, all right. Materiality allocated to account balances up here is called the tolerable misstatement. All right, and that's a word you might not have come across before um, and not many audit students have. The tolerable misstatement is the materiality for a specific account. All right. So we have our planning materiality at the high level. We have materiality for you know, classes of accounts, maybe overall assets. But when you're auditing one specific account, you have something called a tolerable misstatement. And that's just that sub-level for that specific account. So how do I use materiality to evaluate my audit findings? You know, I do some procedures. So typically what will happen in the audit is we will perform our audit procedures and they keep a worksheet or a tally of the errors that they find. All right. And typically we're looking for these ones, known misstatements. We need to support with evidence every misstatement that we manage to identify, all right? And that evidence will tell us what transaction it might be, uh, what the error was, and it'll tell us how much, okay? And then we're gonna need to learn to do some mathematics, which we'll talk a little bit about next week. But we have a tally of all of those. We might be auditing sales, we might find five misstatements. And so we need to think about how much are they? Do they exceed our tolerable level of misstatement? Or are they only minor things to consider? So here's some examples here of a little worksheet. Um, we're going to do more of this sort of stuff a little bit later on when we're going to get into some hands-on practical things where you're actually going to be looking at evidence. You're going to be following an audit program and executing those procedures and then calculating what the misstatement could be. So here, we've got our tolerable misstatement. This is our, remember, our materiality. That's sort of like our materiality for the account. All right. We've got our known misstatement. So this is what we found from our evidence. All right. We have to take into the possibility that when I selected a sample of evidence, there could be some error in there um, and then the total. We're not going to go too much into sampling error just yet. So don't worry about that. All right. So we have this idea of materiality. There's some sort of dollar value or qualitative factor where I'm looking for um, errors above a certain amount. How do I know what that number is? We're gonna start by delving into something called the audit risk model. So audit risk is the risk that I express an inappropriate opinion when the report is financially misstated, all right? So this is saying here that I would give an unqualified audit opinion when in fact there are errors, okay? And we know that when I give that unqualified opinion, even though there are errors, I expose myself to legal liability. And that liability could be to the client, all right? It's going to be to the regulators and it's going to be to the shareholders. We know all about our uh, legal obligations there. So risks come from three particular areas. Our audit risk 
So our, let me say add here into here, audit risk is a function of three different things. All right, number one, inherent uncertainty about the appropriateness of evidence, the internal controls, or whether the financial statements are fairly um, constructed. So part of my job is to be able to identify the risks and where there is a greater risk of misstatement conducting audit procedures to gather evidence. So I use something called the audit risk model. Let me highlight this for you. All right. If there's one key thing to take away from today, it's about getting a foot in the door with the audit risk model. All right. And the audit risk model is a function that helps us plan and decide what we're going to do on the audit based on the sorts of risks that we see at our client. All right. So it's sort of like a contingency model where it says, if the client is like this, then do this. If the client is like option B, do something else. So we have sort of general plans. So here is the audit risk model. And you might see AAR or sometimes you might just see AR. So sometimes that other A is not there and you might just see it like this. All right. Um, and then often you'll just see DR rather than planned detection risk. Now, how do we get to this model? This model actually comes from a different sort of format where it says the audit risk, oh, why is my pen not working, is a function of the inherent risk at the client, the controls they put in place, and detection risk, which is my ability to collect the correct appropriate audit evidence. Okay, so the audit partner sets the audit risk. Okay, so the audit risk here is set by the partner of the firm. We talked about this last week and it is generally low. All right. The inherent risk and the control risk come from the assessments by the auditor. All right. So last week we looked at assessing the inherent risk of the firm. We did that today again in our chutes. And then the detection risk is the thing that the auditor actually needs to solve. All right. So if we remember basic algebra and I say, okay, this is my original formula, the risk of giving an incorrect opinion is affected by the inherent risk of the client the quality of their internal controls to prevent errors, and my ability as the auditor to find misstatements, then this, if the partner sets this and I assess this, detection risk is the bit I need to solve. So therefore, to have detection risk on its own, I divide both sides by inherent and control risk, put my inherent and control risk over this side, and I come up with this formula. All right, is, that base, is everybody okay with that basic algebra? Great. All right, so let's get into what each of these components means. Who's already a tiny bit anxious and confused? All right, that's okay, because we're going to start, we're going to go through, all right. So my objective is to have low audit risk, all right, because I want to reduce the risk of being sued, okay? There is an inverse relationship between the level of inherent risk and control risk. Let me just write my little formula up again. Uh, detection risk is audit risk divided by inherent risk and control risk. All right. So if we think about just pure mathematics, if this is one level and I've got high levels of inherent risk, high risk that there are going to be errors in the, mis in the financials, because that's really what this is. Let me just change to some text and I'm going to type some things in here. Inherent and control risk is essentially the risk of misstatement. All right, uh, let me put that together. All right, so inherent risk and control risk is the risk of misstatement, okay? If the risk of misstatement is high and detection risk is the risk of not, of, uh, not detecting an error, all right, 
So if the risk of there being errors is high, do I want to work harder or do I want to engage in less work to find them? Do we need to work more or less if there's greater risk of there being errors? More, all right? So if there's higher risk, then I need to do more to try and find those errors, okay? And if I do more evidence collecting, then is the risk of not finding something, the risk of missing something, lower or higher? If I do more work, I collect more evidence, the risk of missing something would be lower, okay? So that is what I mean here when I say this is an inverse relationship. So when this is high, I need to develop an audit strategy, an audit plan that minimizes the risk of missing something, all right? So just like if the risk of not knowing a topic for a final exam is high, then you're going to study a lot to make the risk of failing on that question very low. Yep? Is everybody with me? Good. I'm seeing nods. That's good. All right. That's half the battle, most of the battle for the audit risk. All right. So what about the risk of the client on the audit risk? And we, you know, we think about this at the planning stage and even sometimes before we accept the client. All right, there are some people that, you know, I really wouldn't want to audit because the risk of being associated with that client is just too high. So engagement risk is the risk that I could suffer harm even though the audit report was correct because of some sort of other factor, all right? And so that could be if the client is doing something like, hang on a second. So if the client is engaging in illegal activities or the client could be engaging in something controversial. All right. So, you know, there aren't really a lot of people lining up to be the auditor of the publicly listed company that is a brothel. Um, administrator. So, and I couldn't believe, I can't remember the name of the company, but there is actually a publicly listed company that runs brothels. I'm not sure, even though it's legal, whether, you know, as an audit firm, you might want to be associated with auditing that sort of company, potentially. Right? Somebody has to audit it, so somebody does pay a lot of money uh, to have the audit, but you could be auditing something controversial. You might be auditing a controversial person, Anyone name a controversial person who fronts a company that we might not want to audit? Trump. Donald Trump. Yep. Clive Palmer would be sort of our equivalent, uh, I imagine, there. But there might be controversial people, controversial businesses. Um, I probably, you know, if I'm thinking about this from a corporate social responsibility standpoint, I wouldn't really want to be the audit firm who must be associated with auditing the companies that run those terrible refugee, you know, illegal asylum seeker camps on Nauru and, and other places, which I think might be Transfield. Um, you know, I personally, as an audit, if I was an audit partner, and I have a, a very strong stance uh, against the government's current policy on how we treat refugees. I probably wouldn't want to audit that company because of all the controversy that could be surrounding that. So there are reasons why we might choose to not have particular clients. So selecting our, the right client is critical. Um, if there is a client that has a lot of external users relying on the financial statements, there's a greater risk. If there's a likelihood that they have financial difficulties after they get their report, if we say, hey, you're not a going concern, there's lots of risk. And if we think that there's poor management integrity, right? this is the Donald and the Clive type of situations. Um, and if anybody watched President Obama's uh, <laughs> White House Correspondents' Dinner, they certainly put the boot in. Um, you know, where was Donald at the Correspondents' Dinner? I think President Obama said he could be at home enjoying one of his Trump steaks, uh, potentially. I certainly want, wouldn't want to be gaining a qualification from Trump University. So what affects our inherent risk? And we've already done some stuff in class today. We look at the client's business. Complex businesses typically mean complex accounting. All right. 
So that could be it. Previous audits, if they've received um, a modified opinion in previous audits where they haven't been telling the truth, that increases the risk that they're telling the truth another time. The first engagement, the first time you ever do the audit has the most risk because you know nothing. So you are Jon Snow in this instance. And uh, I won't give anything away. And you know nothing. Whereas the second time around that you do an audit, certainly you know more about who's involved, what sort of accounting happens, so the risk is a lot lower. Related parties are always a risk. Non-routine transactions that don't follow a standard procedure are a risk. Areas where there's high judgment. Can anyone tell me what sort of parts of the accounts might be high judgment accounts? Goodwill, yes. Intangibles. Anything else that could be high risk? Foreign exchange. Yep. Anything that involves some sort of derivative security. Derivative. Financial derivatives is high risk. All right. Anything where there might be, you know, many parties that are consolidating. Because you guys remember doing consolidations. Not easy tasks. Especially if you're consolidating in multiple currencies as well. So where there's estimates, there's always more risk because estimates rely on the client accountant professional judgment and they rely on our professional judgment. So what if our professional judgment and their professional judgment don't match up? And then the makeup of the population. So that means looking at the transactions. If we're selling to mostly reputable companies that are well known, then there might be lower risk associated with auditing that company. So what about risk and audit evidence? This is pretty easy. The relationship is really easy. More risk, more evidence. All right. And also where there's more risk, the auditor will charge more dollars. All right. And you'll figure that out at the engagement phase before you start the audit. You'll set your fee in accordance with the risk. When there's more risk, we also might want to make sure that we have staff who are more experienced, all right? Uh, more careful, um, more supervision. Uh, so you might have you know, more partners or senior staff reviewing on the audit. But typically, more evidence is the main one because it's not easy to get more experienced staff onto an audit. But you may use more specialists or experts. All right. Uh, now, I'm going to get into control risk in the next little section. So we'll just get this here. OK. And we don't need to worry about that. All right. What about materiality and risk? So say I set my materiality at 20 million, but I discover that the client is very risky. Is my risk going to be higher or lower? Oh, sorry. If I, uh, totally confused. If I have my client and I find that there's a lot of risk, should I set my materiality higher or lower? Lower. lower. Yeah. More risk, lower the materiality. That's a simple as it gets, all right? So risk is a measure of uncertainty, but generally, increased risk results in decreased materiality, all right? Now, for the mechanics of this, I'm gonna send you guys to a YouTube video where I use a little beaker diagram where I talk about um, why we would lower our materiality level. All right, so, are we doing on time? Okay. Here is where we get into some of the actual stuff that you guys are going to be able to do every single minute of every single day. All right. So I, at this point, tell my students, this is where you need to start immersing yourself in accounting and auditing. All right. And I walk around everywhere, every day, watch TV shows, everything, with my auditing glasses on. All right. I'm looking at everything through the perspective of an auditor which might not sound terribly exciting, but it is. But that is what I want you guys to do over the next few weeks. And I'm going to give you some exercises after today 
um, that you can voluntarily do, but we find are really useful in helping you get an understanding of internal controls. So internal controls are simply, let me just change my color here, maybe not to the weird orange. Internal controls are our policies and procedures, all right, about what to do for a client. You know, and they cover everything from making sales, they'll cover human resources, they'll cover accounting, they'll cover occupational health and safety. So, you know, work safety, lifting things the right way. If there's a spill on the ground, you know, somebody has to contact cleaning immediately and they put one of those little yellow signs out that says slippery floor. It's security. All right, it's working hours, it's superannuation, it's everything. So companies have policies and procedures for doing everything. At UTS, there's policies and procedures for doing everything. Rules for students, rules for staff, rules about exams, rules about degrees, rules about being on campus or being off campus. So all of these rules. So we're going to look at how these rules affect my control risk. All right, because remember, my control risk feeds into my audit risk model and my audit risk model affects how I'm going to collect my evidence. Okay? It's going to affect how much work or effort I'm going to put into my audit. Where there's a lot of risk, I'm going to put in a lot of effort. All right, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about slightly different strategies that we choose here. So why do we have internal controls? Why do managers implement policies and procedures within organisations? Why do we have rules in our jobs? Any ideas? Make sure that everybody's doing the same thing and they're doing it all properly. Right? So all sales are recorded in the same way. Okay. Anybody here ever worked at a fast food place, McDonald's or something similar? All right. So why is there a specific way to make a burger? Consistency. All right. So the reasons why organizations have rules is we want to make sure that there's consistency. That could be in the service that we provide, in the product we provide. And we want to have consistency in accounting for what reason? So you can have consistency in your goods and your services, but we want to have consistency in accounting. Why do we want to have consistency in our record keeping? Comparable. comparable. Yep. So that we can have comparable data. And what do we use that comparable information for? What do management use information that they gather from within the firm for? What do they do every day? What's a manager's job? Making decisions, yeah. So we need to have comparable, reliable information so that management can make decisions. Because when management make decisions, they're helping the company achieve their objectives. Right? And those are the objectives of shareholders, increased profit or sales or whatever it might be. So for a manager, having consistent, reliable, comparable information is important for their own internal decision making. Because if you make a decision based on inaccurate information, then you could be making the wrong choice. And you could be sending your company down the wrong path. All right. Has anybody ever seen the movie Margin Call? No? If you haven't, and you're looking for you know, procrastination, go to iTunes, rent the video or uh, the movie, and you'll watch uh, a really great cast talk about how one misinterpretation of a piece of information brought down an entire financial services company because they'd made wrong decisions based on it. So this could be really, really, really important. Right? If enrolment information was 50% inaccurate, we could have the wrong numbers of lecture theatres or students in classes, it can have a big impact. So management want to have so that they can make great decisions, reliable financial reporting. They want to make sure that how they do things, 
how they make something or provide a service is effective, does its job, and is efficient. What does efficient mean? They're doing it for usually the least amount of effort, time, or dollars possible. All right. So for managers, they want good financial reporting, and they want to make sure how they do their business is efficient and is effective, and they want to make sure that they comply with laws. All right. So we want to have you know, controls over paying people so that we always pay them the right rate, the right number of hours, and the right amount of you know, superannuation that's required by the government. So we have internal controls to help managers. We have internal controls to make sure that operations are happening smoothly, guys. And then we have internal controls to make sure that we're following the right laws and legal obligations that we have. And that's not just accounting. It could be occupational health and safety. If you're looking at a chemical company, it could be having the right um, spill information. If you spill a chemical, what happens? So what is management's responsibility? Management's responsibility is to establish and maintain these internal controls overseen by the uh, board of directors. All right? So they have to design the processes that go within that organisation. They have to design remuneration plans, uh, manuals for processing tasks. A company should develop internal controls that provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are fairly stated but it cannot be an absolute guarantee. Why? Because generally these systems are computerized. Computerized systems could have incorrect programming. Systems could go down. You know, look at Telstra. They have a, you know, some sort of failure. Somebody cuts a wire in a wrong place and suddenly nobody has the internet or the phone. Um, so we need to make sure that it's reasonable assurance for the financial statements. Now, there are some limitations to building internal controls. Cost effective. Controls are expensive. The most effective control to stop students cheating would be you to sit in a room on your own with one examiner watching you the entire time. Right? That is the most effective way to make sure that you're not cheating. It's a bit cost ineffective though. So remember in CMS, you would have looked at cost versus benefit. All right, and that's exactly what we have to do for internal controls. Cost versus benefit. So uh, my dad, who's now retired, but he used to run an Italian restaurant and cafe. And you might think that sounds a bit funny because I'm Chinese. He didn't cook, he just, he owned and ran the place. We had a lovely Italian chef. But they also sold coffee in the mornings. They're one of the busiest coffee shops in all of Sydney. And when he took over the business, um, he, instead of having a cash register where people would pay, he had this big bar where you would go up and you would place your order with one of three different baristas. You would say, oh, look, I have a flat line. Prices were all up on the board. And to make things easy, he never charged, you know, coffees were not like $3.85. They were $2.50, $3, $3.50, so that people wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to try and give, you know, five cents change or 15 cents change. And to speed things up, he said, well, instead of having a cash register, I'm going to have this bar. You're going to give your order to the barista and you're going to put your own money down on the counter and you're going to take your own change. Okay? Everyone's looking at me like, really? <laughs> this is true. I, I wish I had some video footage of this happening. It stopped after he sold the business after about 10 years. But he said... What's the worst thing? You have to line up to wait and pay, then you have to get your change, and then the person who took your order has to transmit that to the barista, and then you have to wait, right? In the morning, nobody wants to wait for coffee, right? You sit there, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the huge queue of people outside Knight's Coffee and Tea in the tunnel at Central. Nobody likes to wait. It's never pleasant. You're like, please say my name next. Please let it be my name. And then you hear your name, but you're like, oh, I ordered just recently, is that somebody else with my name? Okay, is that, or, or is that person stealing my coffee? Hang on, we have the same name. Is that my coffee or your coffee? So he said, people don't like to wait for coffee. And, you know, he was thinking about materiality. Sometimes people might, he believed that people were inherently honest and that people 
might, you know, he would have customers say, oh, look, I'm short on money today. I'm only going to give you $3, but tomorrow I'll bring the rest. All right? Now, he had regular loyal customers. And I said, but what about the risk? People could not pay. People could take the wrong amount of change. And he said, this is where, and you probably cover this in MDC, the idea of the panopticon comes into play. So if you guys looked at the panopticon in MDC, yeah, you're probably trying to forget the idea of the panopticon, which is somebody is what everybody is watching everybody else. All right? And he said, my customers know me so well that they keep an eye on new people that they might not recognise. Because, right, you normally catch the same train to work in the morning. You probably order coffee standing around the same sorts of people. They might be your colleagues or you might recognise them. So if there's somebody new, his customers would keep an eye on new customers. They'd say, oh, and people go, where do I order and pay? And they say, oh, you order at the barista and then you just put your money down and then you take your change. All right? And so he said, look, my customers keep an eye on each other. What I haven't told you yet is that at that point in time, the chief of the New South Wales detective's office was in the same building as his coffee shop. So in the morning, standing there ordering coffees were detectives in plain clothes, um, formal you know, commanders and, at higher levels in their uniforms with all their little stars and things, and regular police officers. So he had an external control standing on the coffee line, and people never dared take the wrong money. Or if someone did, a customer would say, hang on, uh, I think you took too much change there. All right. So for each individual business, you need to think about cost versus benefit. He said, I want to sell volume of coffee. I don't care if people steal you know, two or three dollars, um, and I've got all these other controls, like really loyal customers who have high ethical values keeping an eye on things. Now, that's probably not going to work at McDonald's, <laughs> all right, or at a jewellery store where, you know, you just buy and take your own, but you need to think about cost versus benefit, all right? And my dad wouldn't even, you know, at the end of every couple of hours or every hour, he would just get a bucket and he would just slide money into the bucket and then count it at the end of the day, okay? So we need to think about cost versus benefits. Controls are usually directed at the standard transaction. If you ever try and do anything unusual, like unenroll from a subject and get a refund on your fee, you probably need to speak to the student centre because we don't have a really clear policy for that. There is the potential for human error. You know, that you type 5,000 in for something instead of 500, and suddenly you go, oh my God, how did I get 5,000 packets of post-it notes? And I order only ordered 500. People could collude and work together to circumvent a control, all right? So that's always a possibility. People who are in a position of power could abuse their responsibility, give contracts to friends, give high discounts to friends, or procedures could become inadequate. And now that's typically the case when companies have experienced significant levels of growth. Um, so you might have procedures for a small company of 20 people, you suddenly burst onto the scene, you get a whole lot of funding, you know, suddenly the product that you're uh, using, you send one to uh, Princess Kate or the Duchess of Cambridge, she's wearing it and snapped in some sort of magazine and suddenly everybody wants to buy your product and now your company is 200 people, the procedures you had probably aren't going to work anymore. All right. So... Controls are great, but there are some risks. And these risks are things that we need to look out for. Could there be a missing control because we never thought we needed something and the company's grown? Could there be people colluding together? Could there not be a control because it's not cost effective? Right? If Woolworths wanted to eliminate 100% of risk, they will put everyone through those, one of those X-ray X, X scanners that you have at the airport. You know, You stand there and you put your arms up like the big X. Uh, and if they wanted to be 100% certain on theft, they'd do that or they'd have a security guard pat every single person down as you left the store. Number one, that's not cost effective. Number two, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to shop at a supermarket where I'm going to have to be patted down every time I walk out. So we need to think about all of these at our clients. Okay. So 
How does IT affect internal controls? In many instances, instances it's replaced human uh, processing. So, you know, you can't order a good probably online that's not in stock. Um, it automatically controls prices. I can remember going to the supermarket as a child and my mum would have me look through the cans of goods because there were stickers on cans, there were no barcodes. And she would look for the one that had, she goes, look for one in case there's a wrong sticker with a cheaper price. You know, that would be my job as a five-year-old at the supermarket. So IT has changed the way we've, had in, we've implemented internal controls. A lot of people, things are now computerised, but there's also more risk. All right. Why is there more risk with computerization? What sort of risks exist with computerization? Hacking. All right. If anybody else is waiting for the season two of Mr. Robot, anybody watch Mr. Robot last season? Yep. No. If you haven't, I t you should watch it for homework. Here we go. I'm telling you to watch TV for homework. Watch Mr. Robot. Um, you know, I'm not teaching. You don't need to learn how to hack. But certainly, the risk around putting data onto technology means that there's the risk of hacking, there's the risk of poor programming. All right. And then also, you have risk on relying on your system. Okay. And, you know, when the Commonwealth Bank's internet banking goes down, that means you can't use FPOS at their stores, you can't take money out, you know. I think it's a very rare day today that I have $10 in my pocket because I found $10 in my pants this morning when I went to put them on. Must have been there from last time. But normally I only carry a couple of dollars in my pocket. And if I needed to buy something and the FPOS network was down, I'd be going very hungry. Or asking Nelson to borrow food, to borrow some money to buy food. Now technology helps us process large volumes of data because we now have so many more transactions, but we are worried about that hack side of things. Now, I'm going to talk about this bit uh, with a diagram, not with the contents of your slide. Let me just check something. Okay. So ASA 315 talks about the five components of internal control. All right. And I'm going to draw these in a diagram for you to make this easier. And there's a video on this online, so uh, you don't need to worry about. Okay. So the first thing we're going to have is our control environment. <coughs> All right. And that's down here. Okay. Now, my control environment is the organizational culture. It's um, the company in itself. All right. How does the company operate? Who are the people? What's going on? Okay, my next one, B, is my risk assessment process. All right, how does the organization minimize risk? Do we do regular evaluations? How do I know what risks are out there facing my organization? Then we have control activities. All right, what do I do to Minimize the risk of control, the, minimize the risk that might occur, okay? So what happens is I might identify a risk here and then I might implement a control, like the risk of theft at JB Hi-Fi means that most products have a little RFID chip on it and that needs to be deactivated before you take your good out of the store. Otherwise, when you go out, it goes beep, 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 beep and the security guard is chasing after you, okay? So I have my control activities. Then I have my information and communication systems. Oops. Okay, and what that means is, what do I do to collect data about my transactions and the system and the control environment and the control activities? And then I have monitoring. All right, and my monitoring sits up here. And my monitoring is making sure that my control activities are doing what they're supposed to be doing and that I understand the risks that are occurring in my firm and I understand my environment and I get that information from my systems. Okay? So this is how most organizations are set up. You have your risks. We are specifically interested 
in identifying what control activities occur in a process, all right? And then I'm interested especially in monitoring. Why am I really critical? Why do I have to have monitoring? I have to have monitoring to make sure that my controls are working. But more importantly, I want to know when my controls stop working. All right, that is probably the reason why monitoring is more important, okay? So if I'm a bank and we've got an ATM system, I don't need a notification every single time a successful ATM transaction has occurred, because that could be billions of emails a day, but I do want a notification if somebody puts in their PIN number three times incorrectly and it chews up the card, all right? I, I don't want a notification every single time you log on to my subject activities or UTS online correctly, but I do want a notification if you have 20 attempts at putting in your password and it doesn't work, right? Because when a control stops working is likely when there are going to be misstatements. Oops. Got a spelling error there. All right. So when controls stop working, that's where there are misstatements. It's sort of like saying, well, let's do the subject of auditing, but don't have an exam. All right. The exam is the monitor. I know people are like, woohoo, I do a subject and uh, that's called a MOOC. You know, go off and, or lynda.com, right? You do a course and not have to worry about an exam. So monitoring is critical. Now, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for places where there is a risk, but there is no control, all right? If there is a risk without a control, then I've got a potential for a misstatement. So misstatements from controls come in one of two ways. Number one, the control stops working, or number two is that there's no control. Okay? Now, what I'm going to give you this week to watch is a video on flowcharting. Right? Who's ever drawn a flowchart before? Process diagram, one person. All right, so this is a new skill, but this is a skill that if you are thinking about going into auditing or accounting or business management, it's a skill that's really critical. And it will be a diagrammatical way for us to determine where there are no controls, all right? So uh, I'll make sure I'll put that up for you guys to watch. Uh, so we can, I'm going to skip through all of these because we've actually talked about all of these. But control environment looked at, how do they look at risk? What are our activities? Now, I'm going to get to an important concept here called separation of duties. Separation of duties means different people doing different jobs. All right? And typically, that means that these jobs are done by different people. Whoever authorizes the transaction is different from the person who does the documentation and records and is different from the person who has physical control. So if I want to order inventory, I have to get somebody to authorize that, probably a manager. The accountant does the records and the warehouse staff have access to physical goods. Right? The reason why we have separation of duties is so that if different people are doing different jobs, there's less chance for fraud. Now, that doesn't work when we have collusion. And collusion is when you've got two or more people in these jobs working together. Right? So you might have a salesperson who creates fictitious customers, but then you've also got somebody in accounts receivable who is approving the creation of these fictitious customers to boost uh, remuneration, perhaps. So different people doing different jobs is important. Now, in big companies, that's easy because there's lots of people. In small companies, that's more difficult, but that's where you typically have more owner control of accounting processes. Okay. So the critical thing for separation of duties is having different people doing different jobs in the following areas. The people who have access or custody to the assets need to be different from the people who can authorize transactions, and that needs to be different from the person who is involved in record keeping. So this means that the person, you know, if I want to order some stationery, 
person who authorizes that has to be different from the person who has access to the assets and is different from the record keeping. Now, when we move to computerization, it simply means that in many circumstances, we end up having different uh, access profiles uh, for certain systems. So certainly, uh, depending on our roles and responsibilities. So as a university lecturer, I get access to details about students enrolled in my class, I can see their timetables, but I can't access any previous results, for example, because that's not part of my job. So it's about access specifically related to someone's roles or responsibility or doing their particular job. Now, in regards to authorization of transactions, generally companies have some uh, established policies. So uh, I need to get my office manager to record uh, or authorize anything over a certain amount. There's usually what we call standing delegations of authority. And that gives people uh, certain uh, rights or responsibilities to order things for uh, certain purposes. So for example, at uh, the university or at any organization, if I might want to order something worth $1,000, then I might need to go to someone like my office manager. If I wanted to spend $10,000, then at the university, I would need to go to the dean of my faculty all right, to spend such a large amount of money. If the university wanted to spend a million dollars, then our university council, which is similar to the board of directors, um, would need. So it's about having um, authorization um, at, at different levels as well. Now, sometimes you might have authorization for specific transactions, especially transactions that might be unusual. Uh, that would not be the same as you would see in the general course of business. Now it is important to make sure that we have adequate record keeping. And this is also part of that information systems and communication systems that I talked about earlier. Um, one way to make sure that all documents are included is pre-numbering them or having them set up automatically and that obviously helps with our completeness assertion. Uh, we want to make sure that we uh, have transactions prepared or documentation prepared at the time of the transaction that are simple, um, uh, designed for multiple users. So you want to make sure you get a form that can be used by you know, sales, not just to retail customers, but to wholesale customers. Um, constructed or designed in a way to make them foolproof. All right. And that can be the case within our IT systems as well. Uh, you might not be able to save a transaction unless customer details are provided. And then we now need to have a detailed or adequate chart of accounts. So it's not just every single account listing, they're organized in particular ways as well. Now when it comes to physical control over assets, obviously these are related to tangible assets only, it doesn't relate to our intangible assets. So those could include things like inventory. Right? It could include things like property, plant and equipment. It could even include things like cash. So that could be something as simple as a lock on a gate or a door. It could be something more complicated like swipe card access. Or for something really complicated, it could be a fingerprint or a retinal scan. And certainly, uh, if anyone thinks back to any of those James Bond style movies, uh, certainly the more complex what you're trying to protect or the more high value, then the more of these sorts of things you're likely to see. Uh, lower value items, you know, storerooms, fireproof safes are useful only for records. All right, um, but not uh, most documentation is electronic these days. Now, in regards to electronic data, it's physical controls. So who has access 
to servers and computers um, who has physical access to those machines. Who has access controls? So this is where making sure that we've got good security profiles. Um, so having good security profiles is always important. Um, within our learning management system, I can do certain tasks as an academic within my subject. Students can do certain tasks, so having access set up for the role. And any student who has ever done an assignment knows this. Make sure that we've got good procedures for backup. Uh, we certainly don't want to lose any transactions. Um, so they can be very complicated on-site as well as off-site or cloud recovery. Uh, now, many, many years ago when I was in auditing, we saw a lot of situations where backup tapes back up every day, kept on-site, then stored off-site once a week. Um, now, in many instances, transactions that happen and are recorded in servers are also backup recorded to the cloud almost immediately. So we've certainly seen improvements in this area in the last few years. Now, we also need to make sure that when we have controls, that we check that those controls are working. All right. So these performance checks are, are a control activity, but also form part of that monitoring of the organization that's critical. All right. So we need to make sure the controls are working. Um, and we need to check on a regular basis that they've been updated. Uh, because most of these controls are going to be IT based. As computer system change and get upgraded, then we do, do need to check that they should be appropriate. Um, who performs internal verifications of computer software? Usually it's different from the people, you know, the accountants wouldn't do it, you'd have somebody specific, or you could even engage an external firm. Now, one of our roles as auditors is to make sure that any process that companies have for changing IT controls is adequately segregated. So segregation of duties applies whether you're looking at people or physical controls like locks or keys um, to virtual electronic controls as well. So here we have an example of a computer system where people have the documents, they prepare their uh, source documents, Somebody enters data and it updates transaction files. Quite often now, this component is all done online. All right. So quite often, entering transaction data might even, if this was sales, be done by the customer on the web. All right. Writing into uh, different sorts of systems and communication. Now, these might be multiple different systems bolted together, or it could be one very large system in something like SAP. As I mentioned earlier, monitoring of internal controls is really critical. We do want to know when controls are operating as intended, but more importantly, we really want to know when the controls stop working. All right, Because when a control stops working, then that is an indication that we might have misstatements entering into the financials. That could be intentional or it could simply be an accident. Something is broken, then a whole lot of transactions may not get recorded. So we do want to know more importantly when controls stop working than when they are working. But monitoring can be a whole range of different things. So monitoring can include things like bank reconciliations to make sure that ca controls over cash are occurring correctly. We could look at things like um, exception reports for failed logins, especially if you've got login details over sensitive information. A failed login could be an indicator of someone trying to hack your system. Monitoring. All right. How do we understand our internal controls? Number one, we need to get an understanding. All right, by talking to people, by interviewing them, we're going to then draw some diagrams, assess control risk, and then feed that into the audit risk model. All right, which will determine our audit strategy. All right, and may lead us back to this point up here. Okay, so 
In terms of understanding our internal controls, we need to talk to people. This is where the interview and communication skills is really important. Look at their policies and procedures and observe. Right? This is quite one of the times we're observing people and making inquiries are the two most common audit procedures that we're going to do, right? Inquiries and observe. We're going to document the narrative is the story and then and then and then. The flowchart is the diagram and a questionnaire. Questionnaires are no good because questionnaires tend to assume certain things about how a company does business. The flowchart is the one I'm going to give you a little video to watch and then next week we're going to do some actual flowcharting in our tutorial and that's going to be good exam prep for you. All right. Uh, okay, so we need to be able to link our deficiencies of internal controls to, and I'm going to change that, assertions. All right. If I find that anybody could give anyone a discount, you know, any salesperson could give a discount of any amount at JB Hi-Fi, then that deficiency in internal control is going to affect the accuracy of my sales. All right, so think about it not in terms of the objectives but in terms of the assertions. All right, so when I'm assessing control risk, is the entity auditable? That means they must have a minimum level of internal controls. You can't just have shoeboxes full of documents and say, ah, uh, here's my accounting system. So for a publicly listed company, that's not a big deal. Make our assessment of control risk based on our observation and understanding. Um, and then decide on our audit strategy. Now, what we want to do, uh, and let's add a line in here, uh, appropriate, so this is about using the audit risk model. And I'm going to set you a video on audit strategies. And we have two types of audit strategies. Number one, if policies and procedures are really well thought out and we think they're really well planned, I'm going to test those policies and procedures and if they work well, I'm going to assume that the accounting data in those systems is correct. Okay? If there's big gaps in the internal controls and the policies and procedures, then I know that there's lots of places where there could be errors. So I'm just going to go direct to the source and check the actual documentation itself. All right? So those are our two main audit strategies, and I'm going to set you a video to watch on those about how we use control risk because we're out of time. All right. Now, we're going to look at evaluating weaknesses where there might be an absence of a control. All right. Identify the misstatement. What account and what assertion could be affected? All right. And then think about what procedure I could use to determine if there are any misstatements. Okay. What are we doing? Oh, okay. I've got like two minutes. Uh, we do need to communicate with the audit committee. We will tell them about any weaknesses we find. All right, so if we find gaps in internal controls or we find internal controls that are not operating correctly or are broken, we will tell them because we say, look, this is affecting your own accounting and you're having misstatements come into your own accounting information which is affecting your ability to make decisions. So we will tell them about those weaknesses, but we will normally do this at the end of the audit. All right, unless it's something really serious that we think they should know now because significant fraud is going on, we usually give them one long list at the end of the audit. Otherwise you just pop into, you don't want to pop into their office all the time. Okay, now we are not going to spend too much time on testing internal controls but we're going to use our nine procedures um, and we're going to go through some actual examples of doing that next week as part of our tute work. So don't stress out too much about testing internal controls. But the most common things we'll do is talk to people, look at documents, observe, and then do a lot of vouching, tracing, and recalculating. But I'm going to work through that with you with some online materials. Now, sometimes if the computer system, because testing computer systems is time consuming, and we want to try and be efficient on our audit, all right? Because if we can be an e efficient auditor, then that means that we have increased profit, or well, the partner gets increased profit. As a junior auditor, you get nothing. Um, but if controls have not changed from last year, 
the computer system and the policies and procedures are exactly the same, then you don't need to test them this year. You can do what we call a rollover. Um, we won't test the entire year. We'll pick samples throughout the year. And then often we will rotate tests of controls. Um, so we won't test every part of this rollover process. We might test sales one year, property, plant and equipment another year, accounts payable. Now that doesn't include the first year. Year one, in a year one of your audit, you have to test everything. Uh, there's no escaping that situation. All right, now, key things I want you to take away from this week. Basic understanding of materiality, okay? Understand the components of internal control, which is my little pyramid thing, okay? Documenting internal controls, and I'm going to give you a flowchart video to watch, and we're going to do some practical exercises on that in class next week. And the audit risk model. Don't stress so much on designing procedures to test controls. We're going to do that in a lot more detail next week. So when you see that bit of the textbook, you can just sort of skip over that bit. Don't go into too much detail. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've had a good first week back. And that means that we are at the halfway point of our semester. <laughs>